Hello, adventurer. It's good to see you. You have made it to the morning grind. Welcome, welcome. It's the live stream at the beginning of the Geekverse, where we talk about all types of topics in geekdom, gaming, and fantasy, with an emphasis on being constructive and creating the things that we want to exist in the world. It's all on the grind, Sizemore. Can't be too fine, can't be too coarse. That's exactly right. There are a lot of adventures to be had today. Dungeons to explore and monsters to slay. And who knows what a random encounter might send our way. That's why we have to prepare. So settle in now for the morning grind with your favorite beverage in hand. Tea? Or maybe something a little stronger. I've got a few bottles of the old Winyard left. Whatever you want. Pull up a chair. Oh, dude. Oh. If you're feeling fancy, how about a cappuccino? Or a frappuccino? Or how about an espresso? Just tea, thank you. Sounds good to me, Gandalf. Whatever you want. I'm just glad you're here. Everyone is welcome. You can just watch if you want. You don't have to worship anything you don't want to worship. Thank you, Mike. But be forewarned. Sometimes we get really strange characters around here. Wait, what's that you say? Why can't you come and be a part of the stream? My wife would disown me. Oh, no, I bet she'll be fine with it. Come on in. Am I scared for my safety? No. What are we supposed to do? Everybody do the secret handshake. Okay. <laughs> secret cultist handshake. Oh, oh, now do wizards who love each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's my friend is a science. I still don't have gifts, but it's fine. It's all on the grind, son. Can't be too fine, can't be too coarse. Dude. This would be a sick place to bring the band. Indeed it would be, Dave. It really would. I'm seeing more people coming in. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Oh, look. Here's someone new. <clears throat> is this the cultist meetup? Yes. Yes, it is. Come to hang out? Uh, hmm. Please accept me. I have nothing else. Okay. We accept you. Everyone's welcome here. Brought some snacks. Well, that makes things even better. You want some coffee? I don't drink coffee. You sure? It's cultist coffee. Well, it makes it cultist coffee. I'm a cultist and I'm drinking it. Oh, then I'll have some. What exactly is going on here? I'm seeing more people coming in. Welcome, welcome. It's so great to have you. Oh, and look, here comes another stranger. Can we help you? Ah, uh, yes, uh, fellow cultists. I could really use some food. Oh yeah? Uh, welcome. We have donuts. Oh, it's me. I'm glad I'm here. I'm sure you have a few questions for me, though. What's your name? Who do you work for? What god do you worship? Great questions, Rob. I'm Steve King, and I worship... Nyarlathotep. No, not really. I'm just Heath, and I won't be worshipping anything this morning. But I will be your host. Welcome to the office. We're going to have a great time. I've got my coffee ready because now it's time for the morning grind. If you could become a fish, that would be amazing. Then I could command you with my mental fish powers. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, I thought things looked empty behind me. We had a discussion last night about um, the uh, knighthood as a feminine imposition upon the masculine. And I took, oh, there it is. I took my uh, picture down and was uh, talking about it last night. So I have to put it back up. It's sitting over there. Okay. How is everybody this morning? Theo is here. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you. So uh, today, we're going to be taking a look at the Conan RPG. That's our main topic for today. I have been told by multiple people in the different comments that I should check out this 2D20 system. And really, I don't, I don't know anything about it, but I found that there is a, that, that Conan uses the 2D20 system and that there is a free quick start guide to the Conan game. And so I thought we should definitely take a look at this. I am, uh, I was slow to get up today, uh, so I'm still not quite on schedule. We're going to have to do some um, day planning at the end of this stream because I, no, no live stream tonight. So I'm going to try to do 10 hours of work today. Um, that I can actually document and everything on the schedule. So hopefully everything is going well with everybody. 
And Stray is here. Stray, good morning. Good morning. And uh, Bubba is also here. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. So um, that's where I am. So let's go ahead and breathe and then sip. Breathe. Always makes the live stream start better. And then take a sip. I've just got water this morning. Need to drink some water. Uh, let me do. Go, let me uh, let me go ahead and put a link to the Discord server in the chat. Uh, yep. Uh, so invite people, Discord server. So if you are new here or if you come across the stream, welcome. If you are watching the replay, the link to the Raven Keep Discord server is right here. So that is in. Love to have you. Trying to build a really great community there. We were talking about productivity yesterday. Uh, we had some really, there's a productivity section. There's a better living and productivity section of the uh, Raven Keep Discord server. And uh, we were sharing around some really good um, YouTube videos and also discussing our strategies for productivity. But my strategy has got to be getting up early. I'm not answering the call to adventure. I got out of that habit. The call to adventure, if you're new here, is getting up at the time you want to get up and starting to work on the projects you are wanting to start on. Good morning, BGD. Good morning. All right. No morning messages today. So we're going to jump right into it. So I'm going to pull up the Conan RPG here. Get my windows in order. Has anybody played this? Now, I know that some people have because people have been talking about, or at least the D the D20 system or the 2D20 system. I know some people have because people have been talking about it on the chat here and in the comments. But has anyone played Conan specifically? How is that as far as my window goes? Okay. So we are taking a look at Robert E. Howard's Conan. And, you know, in some other stream, I was I was talking about how I think that we should appreciate Conan more. Now, actually, that's something that's, that needs to be on my reading list. Uh, I haven't been doing as much reading lately as I really should be. I've been trying to go through films. I've been studying TV shows and films, and Brianna and I have been talking about that. And I watched everything I was supposed to watch, but then my uh, list of things refilled. Which, actually, when I was talking about Conan, there is apparently, uh, what, a Jason Momoa Conan? And I completely missed that. I didn't know that. So that got put back on my list. I'm going to have to try this other... Um, I'm going to have to see if that was any good. But... You know, I guess it's been a couple of years ago now when I was going back and watching the original Conan stuff. I was like, I think that this, uh, uh, you know, it, it seems like to me, at least in the circles that I'm in, Conan is often regarded as a joke, right? You know, that this the muscular guy, big sword, you know, it's fantasy, but it's kind of a joke. But when I was going back and watching the original stuff, and that's what makes me want to go back and read some of the original stories, because obviously they're extremely influential in... Um, in fantasy, I think that uh, maybe it get, should get more respect than at least I've seen it getting in my circles. So uh, who knows? You know, there was supposed to be that uh, Amazon uh, Conan that uh, got canceled in, ex in exchange for the uh, the Rings of Power. And the people who were going to do Conan went on to do uh, uh, the House of the Dragon. But so maybe we need a really good Conan show or something like that to... Uh, be everything it can be. So anyway, this is Robert E. Howard's Conan, and this is the Quick Start Rules and Adventure. And I was wanting to make sure this is what we wanted. Um, and it does look that like that. Uh, I won't pull this up, but on the web page, free Conan Kickstart, uh, Quick Start Adventure Guide, it says in the description, this free Conan role-playing game, Quick Start PDF, gives you an introduction to the 2D20 system, a short adventure, seven pre-generated characters, and an overview of the world of Conan and the Hyborian Age. So I was like, oh, perfect. Okay. So that's exactly what we needed. We, I want to take a look at Conan, but also I wanted an introduction to the 2D, 2D20 system to find out exactly what it was all about. So this sounds perfect. And it might have like a one-player adventure. I'm actually a big fan of these one-player adventures uh, in some of the quick start things so that you know a single person can sit down and play it and understand, um, you know, be walked through how to roll. So and roll, how to roll, what to do, how to actually play. So maybe that's what's uh, in this. So that's what this is. Explore new worlds. 
They've got something Cthulhu Mutant Chronicles. I've heard of that, but I don't know anything about it. Dust. Uh, wait, Simbaroom. Oh, I think I've got that, but I've got that from Free League. Maybe that. Uh, maybe it changed publishers or something like that. So, all right. Credits. Let's go. We want to know exactly. Was there no table of contents? Doesn't seem like it. Okay. So let's see if there's anything on the back. Do they have a back cover? Um, looks like that's just an advertisement for stuff. Okay. Well, according to Trey's... Um, like our lineup about how we look at RPGs, we should take a look at the pre-generated characters just to see what kind of uh, stats and stuff like that we're actually going to be looking at. Andrew says, Andrew, Andrew says, I like Howard, but there's some problematic stuff in there to put it gently. Out of the circle of writers, I feel Clark Ashton Smith aged the best. Uh, I have read a little bit of Clark Ashton Smith, um, but not a lot, but that's interesting. Uh, I would, I would have to put that put uh, Clark Ashton Smith back on the list to really be able to speak intelligently about it. BGD says, reading Howard, the defining character of Conan is his cunning, resourcefulness, and iron will rather than just his brawn. He is no joke in the original stories. That's why I need to, I need to figure out what they are. Because, you know, it, it feels like something that I should definitely have read. I need to start a book reading list. But I got more stuff on my story, my movie and my movie list right now. So pre-generated characters. So this is Maeve, a talented archer. Few Cimmerians leave their rugged hills, but Maeve is one of the oddities. Born to one of the, the southernmost hill tribes, Maeve folk were not so hostile towards the folk of the Bossian marshes and intermarried with them at times. And thus, indulging her wanderlust, Maeve wanderlust, Maeve joined one of their companies, leaning the ways, learning the ways from the famed Bossian archers. Bossanian archers. Since then, she's continued southward, currently seeking what the border between Aquilania and Pickland has to offer. Maeve is tall and lean, with fierce countenance, with a black mane hair of hair and eyes like chips of ice. She wears the gear of a Bossonian archer as well as the thick woolen garments of her homeland. Okay, so. I did happen to read that the 2D20 system is a roll under system. So I'm going to have to figure out how it works. But I did uh, read that. So that means if TN is our target number, we've got something about focus that I don't understand. We've got, okay, agility, we've got a 10 here. And then skills. So maybe this is our core ability, agility, awareness, brawn, coordination, and intelligence. Oh, and personality as well down here. So we've got... One, two, three, four, five, six big categories. Well, as well as willpower up here, so maybe seven. But then we've got um, skills beneath each one. So that could be, you know, base category and then uh, specializations or skills underneath it. So agility, that could be a TN. So we got TN target number 12, 11, 13. So that should mean that the higher number, I would guess, I'm guessing right now, that the higher number is better because we're going to try to roll dice under this number. And then focus. I'm not sure what uh, is going on with focus here. We got something called focus. Soak. Armor, two. Brigandine. Courage, zero. And we have a stress track. So maybe we've got a stress track rather than hit points. We're doing something other than hit points here, maybe. And then, oh, serious harms. So maybe we are doing something other than hit points. We've got stress, we've got vigor and resolve, and we've got wounds and trauma. And then bonus damage included below, ranged, plus two phoenix, melee and presence. And we've got attacks. So sword, maybe medium, reach two, one-handed, four phoenix, parrying. Got a dagger as well. Reach plus one, one-handed, three, phoenix, hidden one, parrying, thrown, unforgiving one. And then the war bow. So this person is the talented archer. So this person has a war bow, range long, or range L, I guess that's what that is. Five phoenixes. We're going to have to figure out what the phoenixes are. Piercing one, volley. And then also steely glare. 
range C, mental stun. So talents, accurate. When Maeve rolls damage for a ranged attack, she may re-roll up to one Phoenix. Deflect. When making a range, a defense reaction using a parry skill, May pays one fewer doom than normal. Educated. When attempting a lore test, if Maeve generates at least one success, she may immediately roll an extra d20 and add the result to the test. Other belongings, basic traveling provisions, and three loads of arrows. Uh, so what, what kinds of characters do we have? We don't have to look at them all. But we, oh, we have uh, Adelstan, a young knight, Eldrick, grizzled veteran, Lucinia, the brave herder, Petrus, the curious noble, and Othwald, the experienced tracker, and Amala, the blade for hire. So we do get pre-generated characters. I like pre-generated characters. Okay. So chapter one, what's in this quick start guide? That's what we want to know. Here in this preview of the upcoming role-playing game from uh, Modifius, is everything needed to begin adventuring in the world of Conan. This booklet begins a brief overview of the Hyborian Age setting and contains a summarized version of the 2D20 rule system. Next, to race the thunder is a short adventure full of harrowing danger in the Pictus wilderness, a battle that only the boldest will survive, and finally, a number of pre-generated characters for use by the players. I wonder how many people you've got to have in order to play this Pictus wilderness or oh, race the thunder game. We will find out. The first story to feature Conan introduces him boldly and decisively, a raven-haired warrior of savage descent, physically indomitable, tanned and scarred from a lifetime of journey and strife, a barbarian from Sumeria, a primitive and uncivilized land far to the north. Conan has traveled far and seen much, squeezing all the juice he can from the fruit of life. Oh, the phoenix on the sword depicts Conan at the height of his ambition, king of Aquilonia, ruler of the greatest country in the world, an honor he has won with the might of his own sword hand. Yet all is not well within his reign. The story begins with a conspiracy made up of dissidents and disenfranchised nobles aided unwillingly by the enigmatic, enigmatic sorcerer named Thothamon, robed, robbed of his power by the loss of an item invaluable to his sorcery. The cabal meets in secrecy, discussing their plans to stir civil unrest. Okay, so introduction to Conan here. So this says, Robert E. Howard's Conan, Adventures in an Age Undreamed of, emphasizes a focus on the original Conan stories. It presents the Hyborian Age as an adventure setting unencumbered by the accumulated rate weight of posthumous collaboration and is the first such game to be developed with close collaboration and contributions by respected Howard scholars and experts. The writings and development team have come together with tremendous enthusiasm for Conan and his world, and the artists are known inter internationally for their prior work related to Conan. And so, Modifius Entertainment is proud to release the Quick Start Adventure as a preview of the core rulebook, reintroducing this amazing setting to its inhabitants and setting a new generation of heroes upon a path of adventure in an age undreamed of. Hey, good morning, Ryan. Good to see you. Good morning. Uh, maybe I just fixed, I saw that my, uh, connection was weak. Hopefully that didn't last for all that long, but maybe I just fixed it. So Conan, the game, these rules will be described in greater detail. These rules will be described in greater detail in the Conan core rule book with additional collaboration, elaboration, and many examples of play in the months and years to come. Players and game masters will have the chance to enjoy a wide variety of source books and expansions, adventures, campaigns, and other play aids all released within the goal of heroic adventure in the Hyborian Age of Conan. Okay. Hey, welcome, everybody. We've got uh, 12 people watching. That is fantastic. 12 people across all of the different uh, channels that we're on. Hey, if you are here and you uh, like the stream, please do hit the like button. I should ask for that. Uh, I uh, always forget. So do hit the like button uh, because maybe then YouTube will pro promote the stream a bit more and we'll get some algorithmic energy going on and maybe grow here into 2020. So if you would hit the like button, and if you're not uh, subscribed, please do hit the subscribe button. Whether you're watching now or whether you're watching on replay, it is uh, great to have you. Okay, so let's... Um, I'm going to skip by 
the world building aspects of this because we can come back to that because I really want to look at the rules and stuff like that. We do have a map here. I know nothing about the world of Conan. So, uh, yeah, this is not a map that's familiar to me at all. Okay, we have a map. Okay, basic rules. This is what I want to look at because we were told. We've, we've been examining, if you're kind of new here, we've been examining uh, RPGs and specifically focusing on their core action resolution mechanic. And that's because that's what I'm putting together for the Faded Edge RPG that we're developing here on stream. So we've been looking at a whole bunch of different RPGs and specifically in the time that we've had so far, taking a look at their action resolution systems. So this section summarizes the 2D20 system for Robert E. Howard's Conan, The Adventures in an Age Undreamed of, optimized for a, a dramatic pulp adventure and heroic conflict. The Game Master should become familiar with these rules before uh, uh, playing. Okay. However, the Quick Start Adventure introduces the game concepts quickly, quickly as they are encountered. Okay, perfect. Allowing everyone to get in and start playing Conan as soon as possible. I think that's great. Uh, we'll take a look at the Quick Start Adventure next. The Quick Start assumes a basic understanding of the roles of Game Master, who serves as storyteller, narrator, and rules referee, and the players who control a character. The Game Master will control a variety of other characters. Yeah, okay. So what do we need to play this game? Characters, all right. 20-sided dice. D20s. Conan uses a, D, a 2D20 system, so you'll need at least two 20-sided dice during play per player. Okay, no problem. I got Elder Dice sitting right here, and I happen to have 2D20s in my sets of Elder Dice. So I'll have those ready. So we're going to need 2D20s. However, you should ideally have at least five or so per person, or five total if you don't mind sharing. Oh, well, I got more D20s over there. You can play with just 2D20s, re-rolling or passing them around, but having more dice is definitely convenient. You can use more than 2D20s per roll, and it's easier to keep track of players and Game Master dice if they are not shared. Okay, so we need a stack of D20s. No problem. I do have them available. Six-sided dice, D6s. You'll need a dozen or so six-sided dice, D6s, for the group as a whole. They are used as combat dice. Alternatively, the Conan combat dice are made specifically for this game. Well, I got a ton of D6s, too. Pens, pencils, etc. Got that. Tokens or beads. These can be anything convenient, poker chips, game pieces, coins, marbles, pebbles, etc. You should have at least five tokens per player to track fortune points. So fortune points. I wonder if this is like our meta currency. Five per player to track fortune points, a dozen or more for the game master's doom pool, and an optional third set of six tokens to track momentum. See, people keep telling me about momentum. So we're going to take a look at that. Um, because the people have thought that I specifically need to take a look at the momentum mechanic. There are also official Conan, Fortune, and Doom tokens. Uh, okay, so this starts to talk about the character sheet. Well, it's not long. So, okay, let's just, let's just go through it the way that it's suggesting here in the basic rules. Okay, so characters. We've got different attributes, and we were just looking at that when we were taking a look at the, um, at the pre-generated characters. So attributes indicate a character's inherent abilities as well as their physical and mental limitations. Player characters' attributes range from 6 to 12, with 8 representing the human average. Higher attribute ratings represent greater ability. So 6 to 12, 8 is human average. So it's always good to have that kind of benchmark there. So agility, awareness, brawn, coordination, intelligence, personality, and willpower. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 different main attributes, agility, awareness, brawn, coordination, intelligence, personality, and power. Okay. Then skills represent specialized training. So that's kind of what was suggested by the character sheet. So we've got these uh, seven major categories, and then uh, skills provide specializations within those. Knowledge, proficiency, or tools, or, or devices, conditioning, special techniques. Each skill is tied to a particular attribute, representing the most common association between that skill and the character's basic capabilities. For instance, craft and lore skills are based on intelligence. So a character's expertise in a skill is the character's mastery of the subject. Expertise. 
Expertise with a skill indicates the likelihood of success. Expertise is added to the character's attribute to determine the chance of success. We call this the target number. So we saw a target number um, on the character sheet. So for example, Uriah's coordination attribute is nine, and he has three points of skill expertise in ranged weapons for a total of 12. The player must roll 12 or lower to succeed on ranged weapon tests. So remember, we're rolling low here. Rolling low in this game is good. <clears throat> Reminds me of GURPS. There's something, something different about trying to roll low. Roll as low as possible. Skill focus. A character's focus in a skill is achieved... Oh, we did see that focus. We weren't sure what that was. So a character's focus in a skill is achieved through constant practice, superior discipline, and deeper insight. Focus with a skill improves the quality of success. Unlike skill expertise, it is not added to the attribute. For example, Zarina has a skill focus of three in survival. Anytime her player rolls a one, two, or three on survival tests, Zarina gets an additional success. Okay, so our skill focus is going to be going up. We're trying to roll low. And if you hit your skill focus number, you get an additional success. Okay. So here's Trey. Trey was talking, Trey's been talking about the 2D20 system. The games I have that are 2D20 are Dishonored and Dune. I'm going to have to look at Dune too. So that'll be on the list. I wish I was more familiar uh, to this 2D20 game. Um, please note that Modifius is about to lose their license to this IP. Oh, okay. So they might not have this very long. Ryan says, I need to get some of these Elder Dice. They look sick. They are cool. They are cool. I've got the complete collection up there. Um, I'm really proud of them. Uh, okay. So, so this is going, their license is going away. That's, uh, so, well, I guess we'll enjoy this while we have it. So, I guess the 2D20 system must be like Modifius's in house system that they use and apply to a whole bunch of different IPs. Okay. Skill tests. Whenever a character attempts a task where the outcome is in doubt, the player or game master will make a skill test to determine whether that task succeeds or fails. Under most circumstances, no more than three additional D20s may be rolled on any skill test. So that's why it said we need five per player. So under most circumstances, no more than three additional D20s may be rolled on a skill test. So that'd be a total of five. Target number. This is uh, the target number of the skill test is determined by adding the character's relevant attribute to the character's skill expertise. A task's difficulty, a value one to five, is determined by the game master. The levels of difficulty and some expert and some examples of what tasks might fall into each uh, level are described on the difficulty table. Okay, but didn't tell me what to do with difficulty yet. Basic skill test. To make a skill test, roll 2d20. For each d20 that rolls equal to or less than the target's number, the test's target number, the character scores a success. Each d20 that rolls equal to or less than the character's focus in the skill used for the test generates one additional success. So, for instance, the Agassian sailor Zachari Zacharias is making his craft test. His intelligence is eight. He has an expertise of three and a focus of two. The target number is 11 because that's eight plus three. Zacharo's player rolls 2d20 and gets the result of 13 and one. The result of 13 generates no successes, but the result of one generates two successes. One for being equal to or lower than the TN and the second for being equal to or lower than the focus number. All right, got it. If the character scores a number of successes equal to or higher than the difficulty of the test. Oh, so the difficulty is how many successes you have to roll. Okay. If the character scores a number of successes equal to or higher than the difficulty of the test, then the task is a success. Sometimes difficulties are summarized by the number of successes required, such as a one success task summarized as D1. Okay, so here is our difficulty table. It does say that we're going to have complications here as well. So simple is difficulty zero, success zero, opening a slightly stuck door, researching a widely known subject, shooting a stationary target at optimal range, average, so average is D and one. You got to figure this stuff out, I suppose, in order to calibrate all of your stuff as a DM. So an average difficulty only requires one success, overcoming a simple lock, researching a little known subject, shooting an enemy at optimal range, challenging. Overcoming a complex lock, research, researching an obscure lore, shooting an enemy at optimal range in poor light. 
Daunting is three. Overcoming a complex lock in a hurry. Researching a forbidden subject. Shooting an enemy at long range in poor light. Dire four. Overcoming a complex lock in a hurry without the proper tools. Researching secret lore known only to a few. Shooting an enemy at long range in poor light and in heavy rain. So five is epic. So we shouldn't have all that many things that are five. Overcoming a complex lock in a hurry without the proper tools in the midst of battle. Researching cryptic secrets lost to history. Shooting an enemy at extreme range in poor light and in heavy rain. So the difference here is extreme range. Okay. Retro, hello, Retro Nerd Girl. Welcome, Retro Nerd Girl. Everybody also check out Retro Nerd Girl's channel. She does movie uh, reviews and things like that on her channel. Uh, welcome. Good to see you this morning. She and I, she was in on the conversation. We were talking about Conan earlier. So, uh, Splythrinth? Hi there. Hello. Good to see you. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. So, 2D20, uh, Trey is confirming, is Modifius's in-house system. And I think either Conan or Star Trek were the first games that were released in this line. D0 rolls are interesting, mainly used to generate momentum. Okay. Oh, so... Uh, Spli Sinerinth says that Mutants and Masterminds was actually the first one that they released an SRD of this system with. So BGD says Mutant Chronicles is a very interesting RPG setting. It features and the feature film with Thomas Jane and Ron Perlman and John Malkovic is an enjoyable dystopian sci-fi actioner. Oh, so there's a movie that goes along with that? I didn't know. Uh, that's interesting. I don't know anything about Mutant Chronicles. Andrew Andrew says, so many different systems out there. Because you spend so much time thinking about games, do you think you risk valuing novelty over tried and true mechanics? Critics sometimes fall into this. Um, this is interesting. Because I spend so much time thinking about games, do you think you risk valuing novelty over tried and true mechanics? Uh, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. And I was, I, you know, it's, I was thinking about something that was very similar to, or about this when I was looking at building out fated edge because you know there's a lot of novelty in for instance the fantasy flight star wars games with all of the custom dice with all the different symbols and things like that which by itself is neither good nor bad right you know just something new something very different something very novel but uh you know you could set out and try to say i, I want to build this in a way that's completely you know in, in something that's completely new uh but actually what I was trying to do with Faded Edge and what I am trying to do with Faded Edge isn't necessarily something that is completely uh, novel. And in fact, in some ways, now it, it's dice mechanics are different, but it, it's it got a very basic system as it stands right now about here's your target number, try to roll over that. You know, make a roll and a bonus. And that's one of the most tried and, tried and true kinds of mechanics. If you're looking for something really different and novel, um it's got to change in the way it generates its numbers, but you know, here's a target number for a difficulty, try to meet that or beat it and you win, uh, you know, and you, and you pass your test. That, that is kind of tried and true. That, that's, um, that's nothing that's nothing that's too new. The nose plays. This sounds remarkably similar to what I'm working on, but with dice instead of cards. Yeah. The nose plays is working on a system uh, with cards. So BGD says Modifius picked up the rights to the Mutant Chronicles and published the third edition using the same D20 house system that is in Conan. Maybe Faded Edge needs to become the Ravenkeep in-house system. I do like quotes in this. It says Conan sprang to meet him and all of his tigerish strength went into the arm that swung his sword. In a whistling arc, the great blade flashed through the air and crashed into the Bosonian helmet. Blade and cask shivered together and Grommel rolled lifeless on the floor. Conan bounded back, still gripping the broken blade. Okay, so when a 20 is rolled on any D20 skill test, the game master should immediately create and introduce an impediment or problem known as a complication. So 20s, bad. Don't want to roll natural 20s. So we're under the compl complications heading. Complications represent an inconvenient change of circumstances. A complication could present an obstacle to further progress, requiring a new approach, like a route of escape being blocked, requiring a new path. 
a loss of personal resources, such as using up a resource like arrows or uh, salves, or something that hinders the character temporarily, a twisted ankle or social faux pas. The important thing to remember is that a complication is an inconvenience. They are independent of success or failure, and it's entirely possible to succeed at a test while simultaneously generating a complication. So is that, I guess that's why this quote is here. So Conan attacks this guy, um, but his sword broke. So he, he was successful. He killed this guy in the terms of a role here, but he, um, broke his sword. Retro Nerd Girl says, Mutant Chronicles is new to me. I'll add that to my list of things to learn about. Yeah, so many things. <laughs> I was just talking about that earlier. In fact, I should probably write that down. So there's a, if there's a movie, where's my movie list? Which has gotten long again. Mutant Chronicles. And then we can check out the RPG as well. I, I've been thinking that maybe I haven't gotten to set this up yet, but Brianna and I used some software the other day to watch a Netflix movie together remotely. And I was thinking that maybe we should set things up like that so that if there's something on Netflix and other people have Netflix, but they want to watch through some of these movies, we should just set up a movie time and uh, all watch together. Okay, so complications should only take effect immediately after the skill's test results have been applied. A character may leave himself vulnerable while fighting, but if his skill test succeeds, his attack still connects before he suffers the complication. So, for example, a Pictish warrior, Dayana, might successfully use ranged attacks, ranged weapons to shoot an enemy with his bow, but on his test, his player rolls a 20. The arrow strikes the target, but the game master might declare that Dakar's quiver is now empty of arrows and he must find more arrows or seek other means of killing foes. Uh, I want to talk specifically about tracking ammunition and, and different thrown weapons and things like that. I was reading about that uh, the other day on some stuff that the angry DM had to say. And, you know, we were looking at Black Hack uh, a few episodes ago. And Black Hack has the uh, usage dice. So I was thinking about usage dice as well. I'm not really sure if I like usage dice. But this is an interesting one too. You never really know how... See, I don't know how much I like this for tracking ammo either. Because you can just keep shooting, keep shooting, and then the dice are going to tell you when you're out of ammo. I mean, it may work. It may work. Tracking you know, encumbrance and then inventory and especially like individual arrows and things like that. There are reasons why I think that it's not done all that often. Uh, so we need a good system for that. Multiple complications can be resolved separately, or the game master may choose to group them together into a bigger problem. For example, if Daika's power had rolled multiple 20s, player had rolled multiple 20s, the game master might announce that in addition to being out of arrows, his bowstring has frayed and broken, or that a cloud of smoke has risen and obscured his targets. Combining multiple complications might mean that instead of a minor inconvenience, no arrows, bad bowstring, it might be that Dakaya's bow cracks when he draws it, making it entirely useless. Okay. Okay, now we're about to get into this momentum that we're supposed to look at specifically. And actually, just one second. I need more water. Just one second. Be right back. Okay, sorry about that. Just dry this morning. Okay. So momentum and doom. We want to take a look at this very carefully. Because, and one of the reasons that uh, this has been recommended to me, and I know Trey has been talking about this a lot, is because um, we're trying to evaluate whether or not we should use a meta currency uh, in something like Faded Edge. I don't have a necessarily a problem with it. I'm not against it on the face of it. But we have been talking about... Um, when we've been going over the Fate RPG, oh, which we do need to look at Fate Accelerated. Uh, when we were taking a look at the Fate RPG, we had some problems with its manifestation. 
Like, and our example is always, if somebody is on fire, why do I have to pay another, um, why do I have to pay a fate point in order to cause the on fire effect to, to take place? It doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. I, I want something better than that or something different than that. Cortex seems to do that. It does use meta currency though, but I think Trey was saying that momentum might do something similar without having to go outside of the game, you know, outside of the universe to the meta currency. So that might be good. So I'm very interested in this. All right, so let's go to momentum. Let's read this first. Doom is a complication. Well, okay, let's say Doom is a complication. It's, it's in, in this other uh, column, so let's try that. We haven't really read about Doom, but we'll see. If no idea for an appropriate comp comp if no idea for an appropriate complication springs to mind, the game master can instead choose to add two points of doom to the doom pool. This method allows the game master to refresh a dwindling doom pool, accepting doom instead of inflicting complications on the player instead. If a game master controlled non-player character suffers a complication, if a game master controlled non-player character suffers a complication, the game master can have the non-player character suffer complications or the player can ask the game master to remove two points from the game master's doom pool instead. The game master has the final say, however. So it sounds like doom points are kind of like a meta currency in here. Additional results of 20 can be spent on reducing the doom pool by an additional two points, though it cannot be reduced if it has only one or zero points left. Doom on page 29. We'll have to look more on doom. Okay, but momentum. Okay. So when the number of successes scored on a skill test is greater than the difficulty rating, rating, the excess successes become momentum. Momentum can be spent immediately to perform the task faster or more efficiently, or can be saved and applied to subsequent actions taken on the same turn. Well, taken on the same turn. Subsequent actions taken on the same turn. Up to six points of momentum may be saved at any given time. If a skill test is not successful, no points of momentum are earned. Momentum can also represent cooperation, group dynamics, dynamics, leadership, action coordination, assistance, and other forms of teamwork. Players may have saved momentum. Players who have saved momentum can also spend it to assist the actions of other player characters, and they can use that momentum in addition to any momentum they have they might generate themselves through successful tests or other effects. If players wish to share momentum or save it beyond their turn, they place it in a momentum pool from which all the players can draw. Huh. So players cannot hold on to momentum of their own beyond their own turn. Momentum is either used immediately or during that turn, used immediately or during that turn, placed in the shared pool or lost. Huh. Oh, okay, wait, hold on. We got stuff going on in the comments. Just one second. So BGD says, Modifius's momentum is an excellent group, meta currency, and resource. Lots of independent games have similar systems. I particularly enjoy the stress system and the waste is not kind from Epic Sloth Games. I haven't heard about that one. Uh, uh, here, let me just make note of this. So what, what this, the waste, so we want to look at the stress system in the waste is not kind from Epic Sloth Games. I like that name, Epic Sloth Games. Uh, yeah, what I'm reading right here is becoming a resource. So this is a different kind of take on meta currency. It seems like what I've, what I've just read so far that it's in universe in the sense that it's generated by your success. So as, as you're generating success, you're generating more momentum. Um, it's, it's not coming from something that's not connected to the narrative. Now to see whether or not you, you decide whether or not you think that's connected to the narrative or not is, is different. Um, but that's not really the argument, I mean, the argument here. It's different from how fate points go, which are all like RPG related, you know, the, the role playing related. So Splicerinth says you use ammo as depicted in pre-generated PC sheets to use special ability of bow, i.e. volley. Otherwise, not really. Oh, uh, uh, really? So you have to use arrows to 
use this volley ability. Otherwise, you'll only run out if you have a 20 and that's the complication or something like that. Daniel, uh, Daniel Murphy says, I feel like these are pretty heavy inconveniences. Running out of arrows, yeah. <laughs> that is, or the whole bow breaking, it could be, it could be. Uh, but see, see, that's the problem that I have with these kinds of systems. It's adjudicating these kinds of things on the fly. I feel like that's difficult. Um, what exactly is an inconvenience? Uh, I would want like a list of those to either roll for or to draw from as far as cards go. Because, oh, we, we got to come up with something. Now, it has a default out, the Doom Pool, that we haven't gotten to yet. Well, I can't think of anything. <laughs> All right, uh, what do we do? What do we do? Oh, two more points in the Doom Pool. But it'd be better if there was a list of things that like these are possible inconveniences. Roll D100 or something. But I mean, but even that's complicated because they're not all combat related, right? You could you could roll complications for you know swordsmanship because they have the breakage of the sword is another big one. But you know, you've got other skills too. Trey says, I can only see using the usage dice if you're running a cinematic game. If your game is focused on realism, it doesn't make such sense to use. <sighs> Yeah, you know, I, I want to talk more about this idea of the, the difference between the cinematic and the, the realistic game, because I was actually wondering uh, when I was working on Faded Edge, well, am I really trying to create a realistic game? I would say it's it's it moves in that direction, because, you know, low fantasy world or, you know, whatever the worlds I'm trying to build, so more realistic. Um, It, 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 I think it comes down to having meaning. Does running out of something have a lot of meaning in the game? And if I if it does, like whatever it is, if it's the if it's the oil, right, the oil for the light, because it could be important in this particular game that I got to have light in order to go into the dungeon or do whatever, or go into the basement if it's a horror game or whatever. And so I only have so many units of light, right? Well, that's a resource I'm supposed to be managing. But if I'm using usage dice. I could just run out at a random time that I would prefer it if the whatever um, resource I'm trying to manage is, I would prefer it if that's something I'm actively managing. And if it runs out, it's because of decisions that I made rather than, oh, it just so happens the dice came up that you're out now. Uh, Spliceranth says, I usually use complication to generate doom. That's the easy way, I assume. So, okay, so, uh, so you played. Okay, fantastic. I'm glad you're here um, to talk about that because it does seem like that's the easy way out and we'll have to figure out what we're doing with doom here in a moment. But yeah, that is kind of the easy way out. Okay, throw two more points in the doom pool. The Wink is a post-apocalyptic supplement for the index card RPG that uses a group resource shared a group resource called grit in conjunction with adrenaline and madness mechanic to boost critical roles at the risk of serious complications. The wink. Okay. That uses the group resource called grit in conjunction with adrenaline and madness mechanics. We'll have to take a look at that too. The wink. Oh. Is a post post-apocalyptic IC RPG game look at grit and uh, adrenaline and madness okay thank you Spicerinth says oh what what my oh the wink is the waste is not kind from epic sloth games oh okay 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 so that's the same one okay I'm seeing why is uh Okay, there we go. Uh, Splythrent says, turn is the first of the PCs. They choose their order, then NPC, so momentum generated by one player can be used by the next. Which I do think is cool. Why is all of a sudden, I'm, why am I all of a sudden not able to click on things as easily here? But anyway, the next thing Splythrent says, momentum pulls outside of combat last for a scene, entering combat launches a new scene. All right, let's go on. Um, okay, so most uses of momentum happen immediately after a successful skill test, though the player or game master does not have to choose how to use it until it's actually needed. 
Each use of momentum can only be used once in each skill test unless it is noted as repeatable. Some uses of momentum are listed as immediate. This means you can uh, they can be used at any time, spending points directly outside of the group's pool saved momentum, pool of saved momentum. Players are encouraged to be creative with their use of momentum as they build success on top of success, but the game master has the final say on the outcome of spent momentum, especially when it concerns the non-player characters or the setting. Oh, this is what you uh, we were just talking about here. So at the end of each scene and at the end of each round during an action scene, the group loses a single point of saved momentum or a single point. So you don't clear it, but you lose a single point of saved momentum from their shared pool. Momentum and Doom. Okay, so the game runs off of two parallel resources, Momentum and Doom. Doom is used by the Game Master to introduce additional hardship to the players to activate non-player characters' abilities and generally make things more difficult for the players. Whenever a player character wishes to use immediate momentum, such as to buy an extra D20 for a task, they may do so by adding one Doom point instead of spending one point of momentum. Oh, that's interesting. So, okay, so you can spend one of these points. It's not an extra success, but it is an extra die roll of a D20. But you could say, hey, I need them. Pump up the doom. So example uses of momentum. Well, let's see here. Similarly, the game master is not to keep track of any momentum earned by non-player characters. Instead, any, any unspent momentum from the non-player character skill tests are added to the doom pool and can be spent by the game master as doom. Okay. Example of the uses of momentum. Perform a task in half normal time, cost one. Add plus one damage to a successful attack, one per plus one. And that's, okay, so that's repeatable. So you could do three or something like that. Disarm an opponent, costs two. Add an additional D20 to a skill test before the roll is made. So that's one per D20. It is immediate and repeatable. Increase an opponent's skill test by difficulty plus one, two per plus one. Ask the game master a pertinent question about the situation, the characters present, or something else the player character might be able to discern with that skill test. Okay, so tracking momentum. A useful method of tracking momentum, player and or group, is to place a large or distinctive looking D6 in a highly visible place with a number of dice turned to indicate the amount of current points of momentum. Oh, I was going to use chips or something like that. If the D6 shows a three, there are three points of momentum available. Another method is to use a pool of tokens or additional D20s to track the amount of saved uh, momentum. Yeah, that's what I was going to do. Just don't mix them up with other dice or tokens. Whatever the case, everyone should try to keep the amount of saved momentum visible to everyone at the table, making coordinated actions easier. Easier. Okay. Uh, so struggles... Untrained skill tests. All right, let's, let's skip by that. Turning the tide. How do we get to Doom? What page are we on? Doomed. Fortune, teamwork. Well, I want to read about Doom. But let's see about turning the tide. While, while succeeding is the most common, while exceeding at, succeeding at most common tasks is a straightforward matter, even the most proficient character cannot succeed at the most difficult tasks without effort, opportunity, and assistance. Skill focus allows the characters to achieve higher difficulties some of the time, but to truly triumph, another character needs to find some other way of improving the odds. This is normally done by finding some other way to add extra D20s to a skill test. A character cannot use more than three additional D20s on a single skill test, so no more than five D20s in total can be rolled. An exception is teamwork, where multiple characters can work together, contributing D20 toward a single task. Any additional D20s from momentum or other bonuses must be added before the test is attempted. Okay, buying extra dice with Doom. As noted in momentum, a character can pay one momentum, immediate and repeatable, to buy an extra D20 for a test. This requires the group has available mo momentum to spend or that instead of spending momentum, the character is willing to generate doom points for the game master. Are players willing to use the, the shared pool? It seems like they should be rather generous with it. And that you'd want them to be, uh, the points to be flowing. So doomed. The game master can use doom to trigger events, activate effects, boost the effectiveness of non-player characters, or otherwise make the characters' lives more interesting. I gotta go down to 
page 29. This, I guess that's where we, we should head. So a character can spend a point of fortune. This is the first time we've heard about fortune, right? So a, a character can spend a point of fortune before attempting a test to buy a bonus D20 to use with the skill test. However, unlike momentum dice, this D20 is not rolled. Instead, it's simply set on the table with the one facing up as if the player had rolled the best possible result. This special result is then counted normally, which means it automatically counts as success or two successes if the character has one or more points of focus with the skill. Okay, so fortune, that's really good. Fortune points can be used for more than just buying extra dice. See page 28 for how this powerful resource is used. All right, let's keep going. Let's go zones. Range and movement. Distance and perception. Well, making an attack. Let's look at making attack an attack on our way to... Because we got oh, the Phoenix stuff here. So let's look at making attack before we go on to Doom. So making an attack. The process for making an attack is as follows. Declare the attack. Choose the type of attack being made. A melee, ranged, or threatened. Choose a target for the attack. The target chosen must be visible. There's a viable type of target for the attack. Type of attack. Choose a weapon for melee and ranged attack. Or a method of scarring the target for a threatened attack. Okay. This is the first time I've seen something like a threatened attack. The just like um, intimidation. The target chooses whether or not to make a defense reaction. So this is possibly active defense. The attacker makes a skill test to attack. This is an average D1 test or a struggle if the target is taking defense reaction. Oh, so we have to look up at struggles. Teamwork actions, reactions. Well, I don't remember where that was. Okay. The attacker makes a skill test to attack or a struggle if the target is taking a defense reaction. If the attacker fails the skill test or is defeated in the struggle, the attack ends. If the attack succeeds, then the attacker rolls damage. The attacker rolls a number of combat dice. That's the phoenix here, determined by the weapon attack used and the associated attribute dice. Oh, didn't it say that D6s are going to be combat dice, but that there are special dice that are actually available and made as well? So the attacker rolls a number of combat dice, phoenix, determined by the at weapon and attack used and the associated attribute score. Each one or two rolls applies that much damage. Each five or six creates an effect which applies a one damage and triggers certain attack qualities such as piercing or vicious. Add up all the damage applied. This is the total damage. The defender determines their total soak at the same time. This is a combination of fixed value, such as armor or courage, and dice cover for morale. Cover and morale. Roll the phoenix dice, the combat dice, and add the total rolled ones, twos, and effects to the fixed value. The, the result is the character total soak. So you also have to roll for that. So we've got, well, I need to look at struggles. Because it seems like defending yourself would be something that the uh, defender would do frequently. The defender determines a oh, total soak. We just read that. Subtract the defender's total soak, but you've got to roll for soak as well. So there's a lot of dice rolling here um, involved in making these attacks. So even armor is dice rolls. Um, yeah, I saw 29. I was get, I'm getting down to it. Uh, Splicerent says struggle is skill test versus skill test. Yeah, I figured it was something like that. I, that's why I skipped by it when I saw it. Subtract the defender's soak from the attacker's total damage. If one or more damage remains, this removes a number of points of stress equal to the number of points of remaining damage. If there are five or more points of damage remaining, the defender is reduced to zero. Or if there are five or more points of damage remaining, or the defender is reduced to zero stress of that type, or the defender has no stress of that type remaining, the defender suffers a point of harm. Okay, so let's just go back up. Oh, struggles. Here, it was further up than it was. Okay, so if the defender chooses to defend themselves, we're in a struggle. So if two characters are in direct opposition to one another, 
When two characters are in direct opposition to one another, each character involved in the test performs a skill test related to that action. The character achieving the greatest quantity of momentum succeeds, achieving the goal, though the final amount of momentum is reduced by one point for each point of momentum scored by the loser. In other words, the op losing opponent's level of success detracts from the winners. In the case of a tie, the player character wins unless the game master spends one doom. If two player characters or two non-player characters are tied, the game master should randomly determine the winner, perhaps by d d comparing the related attributes or simply rolling a die. If there are no factors involved, the difficulty of the opposed test is simple, DC D0 or average D1. If making an attack or defending against an attack, however, however, some situations may mean that it's possible for one or both sides to simply fail without suffering opposition. These situations apply to difficulty tests. Uh, okay, you can spend all, okay. So yeah, so we're rolling both then on the same skill and trying to come up with the number of successes and then one player is subtracting the success from the other. So when we look down here at attacking, they're gonna be in the struggle. If the attacker fails in the skill, in the skill test or is defeated in the struggle, the attack ends. If the attacker succeeds, then the attacker rolls the combat dice determined by the weapon attack used and the associated attribute score. All right. So after that, after it's deter determining that you succeed, we're going to the damage dice. So Steely Glare, or one of our characters had that. The basic threatened attack has a range of close and deals two combat dice worth of mental damage with the stun quality. Interesting. So we're taking damage here. Um, damage ratings are in a number of combat dice. Combat dice. Combat dice are a particular way of rolling and reading D6s. They are used for determining damage and governing special effects. When rolling combat dice, ignore any result of three or four. Results of one or two are counted normally, while fives and sixes are referred to as effects. These count as a result of one and also trigger a range of special effects. So it says one and two is two successes, three and four are ignored. Five or six success adds an effect. As shown on the damage table, one type of protection can add can shield against damage from another type. These protections are referred to as soak, which comes as, as a fixed value and as dice. So it comes as both. Soak dice, if any, are rolled at the same time as damage, and all soak dice soak reduces damage one for one. It's possible for soak to reduce the damage to zero. Okay, when characters take damage from any source, it's marked off from a particular form of stress. Physical attacks reduce vigor, while mental attacks reduce resolve. If this attack causes five or more damage, it reduces vigor, or it reduces vigor to, or resolve to zero, the character suffers a point of harm. If both events occur, the character suffers two harms. Harm has different names and effects depending on what caused the harm. Mental damage inflicts trauma, which increases the difficulty of awareness, intelligence, personality, and willpower test by one. Physical damage inflicts wounds, which increases the difficulty of agility, brawn, and coordination test by one. Here are the effects of uh, the effects of harm are community are cumulative. So damage table, physical or mental, what stress it does, what type of harm it does, wounds or trauma, what soaks that armor. Oh, so armor is the fixed number. Cover is expressed in dice. Courage is fixed. Morale is expressed in dice. Recover through resistance and discipline and treat skill, healing, and counseling. Uh, okay, so let's just keep going on here. Other combat actions. Momentum in combat. Conditions. I like conditions. I say that all the time. So we've got conditions in uh, on here as well. Oh, here we got fear. We got fortune and doom. So let's be the, have this be the last thing that we go over here. So we typically go for about an hour and we're just over an hour now, but let's take a look at fortune and doom. Cause it said fortune was really important and I want to see how we're using doom here. All right. So let's, let's look at these two pages or page in a paragraph. 
So fortune, player characters have access to special types of resource called fortune points. This reflects the fact that player characters have drive, ambition, and determination above and beyond most people and can succeed where others might fail. Whether or not they are viewed as heroes, the player characters are destined for greatness. Each player character begins the session with three points of fortune and cannot have more than five fortune at any time. The game master should award fortune points during the session for reaching milestones, creating entertaining moments at the table, and other in-game accomplish accomplishments. As a general guideline, there should be two or three opportunities for players to gain fortune points per hour of play. Okay, here are just a few ways in which fortune points can be spent during play. Bonus dice. Add an extra d20 to a skill test up to the maximum of three d20s. The extra die is always treated as having rolled a one, which is our best number. Bonus action. Perform an additional standard action on your turn. Second win. Recover all lost vigor or resolve. Choose one. Overcome weakness. Ignore effects of wounds or trauma. Choose one until the end of the current scene. Or story declaration. Introduce a fact or add a detail to the current scene. The game master may veto some story declarations or require multiple fortune points for a particularly large or significant declaration. Okay. So Doom. Doom is supposed to be the opposite of momentum. Hello, everybody. Uh, Splithen says, armor is roll uh, armor rolled is um, circumstantial, such as cover. So more, more often it's only used as a static value. So yeah, so there's some, yeah, right. So uh, I was just looking at that. So armor was static, but some things like cover might need to be rolled for. All right, so Doom is the opposite of momentum. So the Game Master's greatest tool of, uh, is the pool of Doom points. At the beginning of a session, the Game Master's Doom pool will have a number of points equal to the total number of fortune points at the table. For instance, if there are four player characters with three points of fortune each, the Game Master will begin play with 12 points of Doom. Okay, so I thought it was the opposite of momentum, but that's generating it to oppose fortune. But it's generated, can be generated uh, during play. During each adventure, the Doom Pool will grow and shrink as the player characters take action and the Game Master responds, and vice versa. Doom is an abstract measure of potential threats and dangers. The larger the Doom Pool, the greater likelihood that something will endanger or imperil the characters. Spending Doom turns the potential danger into actual problems. So using Doom, the Game Master can use Doom for non-player characters the same way as characters can, though in reverse. That is, a non-player character can do anything that would generate one or more Doom. But instead of generating Doom, an equal number of Doom points is removed from the pool. Similarly, just as player characters can add points to the Doom pool when they suffer complications, a non-player character suffering a complication can cause the Doom pool to shrink. A non-player character suffering a complication. Oh, yeah. So, the yeah, the Doom points would go away. Got it. Okay. Non-player character resources. Shots, medicine, ingredients, and other expendable resources used to boost the effect of a skill test are not tracked individually for non-player characters. Instead, a non-player character can be granted the benefit of a single unit of a resource by playing one point of Doom. So I guess that's it. So we're not, that's how they get around tracking equipment for non-player characters right there. So important equipment is just handled by um, Doom. Activating special abilities. Some particularly powerful or experienced non-player characters may have access to potent abilities or equipment. As noted in their descriptions, these abilities may require the Game Master to spend one or more points of Doom to activate them. Seize the initiative. The Game Master may spend Doom to, intercept, to interrupt the action order and allow one non-player character to act early by spending one point of doom. Triggering an environmental effect. Dramatic scenes often play out in exciting environments. A battle in a crumbling ruin, a chase through a busy marketplace, a chasm over a raging river, etc. When describing encounters, the game master is encouraged to provide details to the players to help them visualize the scene, and sometimes it can be interesting to bring the environment alive to the use of doom. Triggering an environmental effect comes in two levels of magnitude. Minor effects, costing one point of doom, are typically things like flicking, a flickering candlelight, crumbling walls, thick smoke, which add to the difficulty of test skill tests or force tests where none was previously required. Minor effects, which cost two or more points of doom, may pose significant impediments to the characters, even causing them short-lived conditions or harm. Other complications. The Game Master can also introduce other complications into a scene. As a general guideline, spending one point of doom should create a complication requiring a minor action to fix, overcome, or circumvent. 
A complication created by spending two points of doom should require a standard action to do the same. Okay, so doom... They is used the same way a player can, but in reverse. Anything that would generate one or more doom, but instead of generating doom, it's the equal number of doom points are removed from the pool. Okay, so you can use them as resources, activate special ability, seize the initiative, make the environment do something, or add some other complication. So this is the quick start adventure, which we don't have time to get into today, but we'll have to do that at another time. But I want to try that out. Uh, I wonder if it's how many, how many players it is. If it's just for one player, we should definitely try to go through it here on the screen one time. What do you think about it? Is it something you want to try out? I know we've got some people who have played it, but if you haven't played it, is this one that you would try out? Definitely uh, let me know. We'll, we'll talk about it here. Uh, all right. Well, I do want to talk about uh, our moving our big rocks today. If you are new here, if you're new here, actually, let me make sure that I've got a Discord link for you. So if you would like to join our Discord server, uh, you can join the Ravenkeep Discord server right here. And please do, uh, Ravenkeep Discord server. And please do hit the like button. Lots of people here with us today. Lots of people are interested in Conan. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And the 2D20 system. So excellent. Welcome to everybody who's here. I really appreciate having you here. And also welcome to anybody who uh, joins the stream afterwards or watches the stream afterwards. If you're new here, one of the things that we do at the end of the morning grind almost every day is try to plan out the day because we want to have uh, so that we will know that we'll have a good day for the rest of the day. How do we want to use the rest of the day in order to accomplish the kinds of things that we want to accomplish? Now, tonight, there won't be a live stream. Ordinarily, what we do, if there's an evening live stream, especially one of the morning, the wind downs, on the wind down, we basically report back and hold ourselves accountable. We were talking about that on the Discord server uh, yesterday, how to ha hold ourselves accountable for the kinds of things that we want to do and make sure that we're spending our days the way we want to spend our days. Uh, so we were talking about that and the wind down, which may become a weekly thing because I've got other shows I want to do in the evenings. We've been doing video gaming. We've been doing um, uh, painting and things like that of our miniatures. I've been still trying to work on these Hero Quest miniatures over here. Uh, so there are other things to do in the evenings, but I'm only going to run an evening live stream five days of the week. So Thursday is our night off. But at any rate, we try to come up with what are our big rocks that we want to try to do over the next you know, nine hours, eight hours, 10 hours. So we use our index card productivity method to do that. And if you are new here, this is the way we do this. So then uh, here's the index card productivity. And then we'll be right back while we plan our day. Well, I manage my department and I've been doing that for several years now. Your department's just you, right? Yes, Jim, but I am not easy to manage. If you would like to join in on being more productive with me and everyone else here on the stream, but are in need of a system to help you out, here's an easy system that you can adopt and that I recommend. Grab a sheet of paper. I find that an index card folded in half is the perfect size for this. But if you don't have an index card, no problem. Any scratch piece of paper will work just fine. Just grab it and a pen or pencil. Think for a moment and come up with the three things that if you were to accomplish them today, you would know and feel that it was a great day. I bet you can take a breath right now and think for just a moment and you will know what those three things are. We're going to call these three items our big rocks. Our objective is to move these big rocks during the day. Now, don't make the rocks too big because then you can't move them. Rocks that are too big to move in about a third of a day, we call those huge rocks. Moving the huge rocks is our major multi-day goals in life. But in order to move them, we have to break up the huge rocks into big rocks that we can actually pick up and move around. But we don't want these rocks to be too small. Because although small rocks are easy to move, we don't feel sufficient accomplishment when we move them. Moving the big rocks makes us feel accomplished because they advance us toward our objectives in significant ways. You decide what size tasks are small, big, and huge rocks for you. If you get all three of these tasks done, then go ahead and add a fourth or a fifth big rock. But don't do that unless you've finished your big three. You want to look at your list at the end of the day and feel success and accomplishment. You can use your phone for this if you want to, but I think a sheet of paper is better because then you don't have to pick up your phone to check your list of big rocks and potentially get sucked into all the distraction on your phone. 
The phone will also let you put 20 or 30 things on the list, no problem. Half an index card will keep this tight and focused. I know there are dozens of things on my to-do list on my computer, and that's too much. This method allows me to extract what I really need to do during the day and focus on that. If you're already using a productivity method that you like, no problem, use that. Do what works for you. Now let's write down our big rocks and try to get them done between now and the wind down live stream in the evening. That's where we check in, see how we did, celebrate success, and see how we can improve tomorrow. If you need encouragement during the day, look to the Ravenkeep Discord server. It's a great and constructive community. Let's take over the Geekverse. All right, so that is our index card productivity method. So I got to talk about what I have got to do today. I've been looking, my, I have been failing to accomplish my, let me bring up my uh, auxiliary camera. Go, go, auxiliary camera. So here is the auxiliary camera where I'm trying to look at my, my day here and plan what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, the, one of the first things is, do we, I got other things I'm supposed to write here. Did I heed the call to adventure? I only get one shot at that of the day. And the answer is no, I slept too late today. So I'm not going to be able to hit that. But I do want to try to move my big rocks, move big rocks during the day. So today... My big rocks are I have got to finish putting together the package for the sponsorship of the Morning Grind, this YouTube uh, live stream so that we can keep going. Or actually, it's more on more than YouTube. I got to put that together. And then I've got to uh, write to not only World Anvil about that, but also some other people who I think we ought to have on board as sponsors for the show. And then also I have a, a meeting this afternoon about uh, the Tales of Rabavania uh, movie scripts, trying to move them forward. So I've got to take that meeting. So those are my three big rocks, and I need to get all three of those big rocks done. Um, I do want to put down here, I need to start making sure that I'm following my diet. I have gotten off of the idea of, uh, I've gotten, I've broken my chain over the holidays of hitting my watch rings. And so I need to be sure that I'm doing that as well. So I'm going to try to hit all three of these. I'm going to have to wait till tomorrow to hit my uh, call to adventure up early and working in the morning. Uh, but I'm going to try to hit all three of these. I'm going to try to stay on the diet. Uh, I think it's warm enough to potentially go for a walk and start the hiking again. So get the watch rings going again. Uh, so I think I'll be able to hit that. And I want to be able to account for 10 hours of my day. So that's one. I'm accounting for these in 25-minute blocks. So basically 30 minutes with a five-minute break. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's nine uh, and I'm already working on YouTube here. So this is like, this is closing in on two hours of YouTube already this morning, including prep time. So two hours have already been accounted for today, but I want to try to make some other YouTube videos just to put out in the afternoons because I need to do that as well. So maybe core creative time and YouTube. Yep. I'm going to try, I'm thinking I need to put some, um, deadlines on when I need to finish writing that uh, the first Faded Edge RPG book, which is only 10,000 words. How do I get out the first 10,000 words of Faded Edge? And how do I get out the next 10, uh, first 10,000 words of both Theophany and uh, Tales of Rabavania world books? I'm thinking that needs to be done by the end of March. That would give me like a month to get all 10,000 words done in each book. You know, three books, three 10,000 10, word books. That seems like a reasonable goal. I need to... Uh, spend core creative time, though, working on those. All right. So, everybody, hope you do have fun, like Retro Nerd Girl says. Uh, removing big rocks today. No live stream tonight. Thursday and Saturday are the nights that we're taking off on the evening live stream. So, but I'll be on the Raven Keep Discord server. I'll be posting to Instagram if I go on the hike today. I think I'm finally at a temperature where I can do that again been fantastic hanging out with you. Thank you so much. Please do hit like and subscribe. If you are not already uh, liked and subscribed, it would be a big help uh, to me. We're going to try to grow and do a lot of things here in 2023. So we are getting ready. Bye, everybody. I will see you uh, in the morning.